Welcome to our podcast on cyber conflict and international relations. Lessons learned and uncertain future. Today we have a very special guest, Mr. Fahad Nabil, who is a renowned cyber security researcher and a cyber security specialist. In this episode, we will explore the fascinating intersection of cyber security and international relations, uh, discussing the valuable lessons we have learned from past cyber conflicts and the challenges we face in an uncertain future. Sir, in your research, what are some not- notable examples of cyber conflicts that had significant repercussions uh, on international relations and what can we learn from them? Uh, first of all, thank you for having me on your podcast. There have been uh, multiple incidents uh, in the past few Stuxnet was the prominent attack which is everyone is familiarized with the data attack which was a joint collaboration between America and Israel and they targeted an Iranian nuclear enrichment facility. So that was a prominent attack which uh, international relations scholars tried to study how in an, a cyber attack had a real uh, physical impact on Iran and how it uh, encouraged Iran to develop its expertise in the cyber domain. So and that was a prominent attack in recent past. If you look on. And from, from there onwards there have been multiple incidents which showcase uh, how uh, states have been using it as a statecraft tool, uh, be it uh, Russia, be it China or be it anyone else, how they have been effectively using this as a statecraft tool. Okay, sir. Uh, this, the study of cyber security feel like it is stuck in the mud. Uh, unable to move forward, uh, often mired in a state, uh, an unresolvable debate. What is the way out of this confusing state? When to act defensively and offensively in the cyber security domain? Uh, so, a good example of this would be uh, the dilemma faced by Americans. Yes. Now, primarily, there are two main reasons why Americans have not been able to retaliate against those against its adversaries. First is that America have never uh, maintained a red line as to this is where an attack goes, so they will say enough is enough. We are going to retaliate. And secondly, uh, they have this fear that if they use one of the cyber tools or weapons from their arsenal and launch it against one of their adversary, so then one of their adversary can steady it, steady their code, reverse engineer it, make the systems resilient to in order to. Uh, make them immune from that code in uh, near future. So these are one of the two main reasons why Americans generally discourage uh, of retaliating against these adversaries. And again, primarily the main issues is because of there is a wide gap between policymakers and those on the technical sides. So again, the policymakers are good in drafting policies, but they have uh, less know-how about the technical expertise. On the other hand, those with a technical background are very well versed in the technical aspects of cybersecurity, but they have no, uh, there are no uh, knowledge or skills on to how these technologies are going to impact human lives and how it might help us in uh, preparing new policies or strategies. So it is important that there should be a bridge uh, of gap between the policy side and uh, the technical side. So it is important, what I personally believe is that the policy makers should have a basic introductory level technical know-how of cyber security and similarly the technical uh, individuals with the expertise in technical side should have a basic introductory level of policy making and uh, other uh, regional studies, international relations studies, studies, in order to know ki how these technologies are impacting real human lives. Do you sir, really think that the cyber security domain has its own ideas in it international relations or uh, this domain is replicating the ideas of other domains in this, uh, international relations? Yes, definitely uh, when we uh, try to apply the traditional uh, IR theories which we learn in our degrees, so those theories might not help us in understanding cyber behavior of uh, multiple countries. For example, the Realist School of Thought believes it, that it is uh, re- it's an extension of the physical rivalries. Again, if uh, Pakistan and India has a physical rivalry, so that is manifest in the cyber domain. On the other hand, uh, the Liberal School of Thought believes okay, it is, again, it is not uh, a battlefield, but rather it's a uh, medium as a way where exchange of ideas and information occurs. On the other hand, Constructive School of Thought believes it is neither a battlefield nor a marketplace, it is what we construct of it ourselves. So again, uh, this traditional theories might not help us in having a better understanding. So again, uh, what IR scholars now do, and again those uh, with the technical background, they come up with different uh, conceptual frameworks and theoretical frameworks in order to examine based on the past behaviors of multiple countries how to help us in understanding the evolving behaviors of nation states as well as non-state actors in the cyber domain. So this question has already been discussed, uh, but I want to emphasize uh, again uh, because there is a big issue in Pakistan that in Pakistan we are not taking interdisciplinary research. Hmm. There is a big gap in between the um, policy makers um, uh, uh, from the social science perspective, while um, the technical background that c- cyber security specialists. So how how to bridge this gap? 
again uh, when it comes to pakistan uh, there are people who are well versed in the technical side of uh, in pakistan there are people again there are institutions which train people to develop the expertise on the technical side of cyber security but again from a social science perspective there are again there are near to nothing in pakistan as to how to train individuals uh, in order to encourage them to understand this cyber security is an interdisciplinary field it is no more a field where people with it background can only have their say it is an interdisciplinary field where people from law background psychology background international relations strategic studies have their input valuable input to give to us to how uh, we should understand and this is reflected in our policies and strategies as to how there is again either we have a policies which are very generalized or either it is adapted largely from other policies or strategies from different countries sir as you say that for people from law background can also get in this domain sir what do international law say about the cyber security domain uh, as we are focusing on international relations uh, when it comes to international law there is only generally one uh, treaty that is the budapest convention and it is primarily focused on uh, cyber crimes and again there are uh, around 35 signatories of that convention so again pakistan is generally not a member of uh, this convention because there is apprehension primarily from our intelligence agencies as to uh, we should not be sharing our because there is a uh, section under budapest convention <coughs> of intelligence sharing so again pakistani intelligence agency have this view point that we should not be sharing our intelligence with a country which we does not recognize mm -hmm. and there is also this apprehension going on in, in our uh, policy circles that india might in future join this budapest convention so again apart from the budapest convention there is generally there are certain norms which uh, countries have agreed upon but again when it comes to implementation of those norms again we does not have a proper mechanism as to that and one of the primary reasons why countries largely have not come up to agreement on international level with, when it comes to cyber security as we have seen in public health or outer space is because the permanent five members of Euro united nations security council are primarily the main obstacle they does not want international law to develop in the true sense because we uh, if you look upon the cyber behavior of countries these five uh, countries are major players in the cyber domain and they are both aggressor and at times victims of cyber attacks so they does not want international law develop, to be developed because if international law develop a sanction regime comes into place so these countries will be the first to become sanction under these uh, 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 regimes so we have seen in the recent polls that india has a huge collaboration with israel uh, in the cyber domain in the it domain and india is much much more uh, uh, stronger than pakistan when it comes to it so do you think that policy makers of pakistan are ready or are, are are they are taking measures to contain india in this domain in the it sector or the cyber security domain india's collaboration in cyber domain is not only restricted with israel it has collaboration with multiple western countries so again when we look upon a base on open source data as to pakistan india so who countries perform better in the cyber domains among multiple indicators so it is clear <coughs> india is the better country when it comes to comparing pakistan well, again there is uh, i guess there might be some realization at the top level as to how we might but again when we look upon this thing uh, at the uh, level of policy making strategy making and how we are generating our human resource training our human resource so we find we are still very uh, lag very behind <coughs> in ever coming to counter indian threat be it in, in the information domain or be in the cyber warfare domain so there is another question which is very important and that is what are the key challenges and uncertainties we face in the future when it comes to cyber conflict and its implication for international relations again cyber domain is an evolving domain what we have been studying um, based on the insights which we are able to develop new theoretical framework so conceptual framework is based on the past 20 to 25 uh, years behavior of states and also directing the cyber domain so again we does not know how things might evolve in next a decade or two as to how also again it's an evolving field and we can only make certain assumptions or predictions about that but again we have to take this and we have to take in this understanding that again these in uh, future predictions might not also turn out to be correct so uh, how much is pakistan military taking measures to set up the uh, already uh, their their measures in the cyber security again uh, last year pakistan army uh, uh, formed its own cyber command again but it is important to know that if we truly want the army to uh, contribute in the cyber defense of the country they need to uh, take on board people with from technical background and they need to come up with a new promotion pathway this is my personal idea there should be a new promotion pathway to in order to speed up these people in the top uh, ranks of army in order to give their out output to the decision making of the army structure as to how pakistan can be <coughs> secure from different threats originating from different countries 
Sir, how do state actors and non-state actors engage in the cyber conflict and how does this dynamic shape the landscape of international relations? Again, states generally there are multiple objectives which every state try to pursue the cyber domain. They might be doing it for domestic surveillance or they might <coughs> be involving themselves in cyber espionage or again they are, might be trying to target certain entities in order to collect state secrets from their adversaries. Similarly, non-state actors include uh, use cyber domain for multiple purposes in order to disseminate their propaganda, in order to recruit uh, individuals, in order to generate funds using uh, cyberspace. So there are multiple ways through which non-state actors and state actors utilize cyberspace. Thank you so much sir for sharing your insight, for sharing your research and for sharing your findings. Uh, as we wrap up this episode, it is clear that cyber security conflict has become an integral part uh, of the international relation landscape, the lessons learned from the past, uh, highlighting the need for robust cyber security measures cooperating among nations uh, and a comprehensive understanding of the evolving threat landscape. Thank you.